Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. We will start our hearing number 20, the last hearing of this period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission entitled The Situation, the Human Rights Situation of Migrants and Refugees in the U.S., which was requested by several organizations from the civil society. My name is Julissa Mantilla Falcon. I'm the first vice president, and I am joined by Commissioner Flavia Piovesan, which is, who is the country uh, rapporteur and Commissioner Estuardo Rablon, who is the uh, rapporteur for persons deprived of their liberty. The monitoring secretary is also here. Before we begin, just so you know, we have a digital tool. So please look at the uh, timer you'll see on screen, which will be measuring the time. We have bilingual interpretation, also subtitles, and this hearing is being streamed on several platforms. Please turn your cameras on and your microphones off when you are not speaking. Now I will uh, explain how we will distribute time. We will start with 20 minutes for the civil society. Afterwards, the, the state will have 20 minutes. After that, the Inter-American Commission will have 20 minutes, and then we will have a second round with the civil society and the state for 12 minutes. Having said this, we, I will give the floor to the civil society organizations. Please introduce yourselves, your names and your organization. Thank you. Buenas tardes. The organizations that requested this hearing, I want to thank the Inter-American Commission for giving us the opportunity to present information about serious human rights violations resulting from the implementation of some of the U.S. immigration policies. Um, in our presentation, we'll discuss how the current administration has decided to continue using Title 42, even though there is no true public health justification for it. Uh, Title 42 also violates international refugee laws and the U.S. legal obligation not to expel or return individuals who fear persecution, death, or torture. Um, we'll also address contradictions between U.S. immigration policies and the stated objectives of the Biden administration's collaborative migration man management strategy. Um, from our delegation, first you will hear from Nicole Ramos, who is the director of the Border Rights Project of Al Otro Lado. Then you will hear from Yael Shaker, who's a senior US advocate at Refugees International. And then we'll close with Bill Heng, who is an immigration lawyer and the director of the Immigration and Deportation Defense Clinic at the University of San Francisco. So I'm going to pass it on to Nicole Ramos first. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Nicole Elizabeth Ramos, and I'm the director of Al Otro Lado's Border Rights Project. We are based in Tijuana, Mexico, where we offer legal orientation and accompaniment to asylum seekers seeking to engage the U.S. asylum process. We also conduct human rights monitoring and file class action litigation against the U.S. government for its violations of the right to seek asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border. Yesterday in Tijuana, I visited a migrant shelter to meet with asylum seekers who are trapped at the border by Title 42. Knowing that I would be here before the commission this afternoon, I asked them what they would say to you if they were given the chance. What follows in this next paragraph is their statement. Dear commissioners, many of us are Mexican and we are terrified to remain here, but we are trapped. We cannot even escape our own country because of Title 42. We are in danger and we fear for our lives here, but we cannot get help from the police because often they are working with the cartels. Many of us come from towns in southern Mexico that are being invaded, and some of our family members have been kidnapped and forced to work for the cartels or simply disappeared. Organized crime kills anyone who tells them no, and often they will kill the entire family to punish those who do refuse. We did not want to leave our homes and come to the border, but we knew that we would be killed if we stayed. It is our right to seek asylum. Many of us have families in the United States who are willing to support us if we are allowed to enter to seek asylum. We believe it is illegal to force us to remain in the country where we fear being killed, and we ask for your intervention. Respectfully, the asylum seekers of Juventud Dos Mil Shelter in Tijuana, Mexico. A few weeks ago, I received a text message from the adult son of a Mexican woman who was receiving services from our program and was attempting to seek asylum. 
She had been kidnapped twice while trying to cross the U.S.-Mexico border and before being expelled. She had been kidnapped and tortured by organized crime in her state of origin, which is what brought her to the border in the first place. And yet she could not escape her own country because of Title 42. She was desperate for help and there was nothing that I could do other than to help her find a better place to hide. Her son messaged me after going through his mother's phone and seeing our conversation. He wanted me to know that she had recently committed suicide and would therefore no longer need our services. Every single day for the last three months, I have received a message from a Haitian man named Sanuel. He is desperate to seek asylum in the US after fleeing political violence in Haiti. He has no legal status in Mexico and is subject to daily acts of racism, sexual harassment and abuse at his place of employment, where he was repeatedly followed by employers and frequently threatened with rape. Samuel feels he cannot go to the police to seek help because his pursuers are capable of paying them off, which unfortunately, it does not cost much. And Mexican authorities systematically ignore the complaints of harassment, discrimination, and abuse suffered by Black migrants. And often, these same authorities are perpetrators themselves. What do I tell people like Samuel? That although I am a lawyer, and the right to seek asylum is enshrined both in international and our domestic law it is no longer available to people like him. That the pandemic and Title 42 is nothing but a pretext for the United States to present more, prevent more black and brown asylum seekers from entering the territory and permanently staying. That at our core, our legal institutions, legislative branches and executive bodies, regardless of which party is in power are deeply racist. The US government's outright refusal to protect refugees is nothing new. In 1939, the US government turned away the MS St. Louis, which carried over 900 Jewish refugees seeking to dock in Florida. Many of those refugees were ultimately murdered in the genocide of World War II. With Title 42 today, it is if we are reliving the MS St. Louis every single day at every possible border point where asylum seekers are attempting to cross. According to survey data from mid-June to mid-August 2021, collected by Al Otro Lado and Haitian Bridge Alliance and analyzed by Human Rights First, nearly 83% of all asylum seekers stranded at the U.S.-Mexico border by Title 42 have been the victim of an attack, an attempted attack, or threats at the border. And what's worse? The US government knows that it is sending asylum seekers back to die when they turn people away from the border and has admitted as much in the context of ongoing federal litigation in Al Otro Lado v. Mayorkas. Outside of the staggering violence faced by asylum seekers at the border, they are also subject to conditions of deprivation so stark, we believe that when combined, these conditions amount to genocide. Under the UN Genocide Convention, to which the United States government is subject, the creation of conditions which deprive people of basic necessities, such as potable water, food, hygiene, and housing, can be considered genocide. Title 42 and other policies which force asylum seekers to remain in Mexico, such as metering and the migrant protection protocols, are creating these conditions, and these conditions are genocide. A recent study by the University of California, San Diego, serving 100 migrants in Tijuana, found that of the 100 individuals surveyed who had been trapped at the border by Title 42 for an average of 18 months, 99% did not have enough money for food, lodging, and medical care. 60% had no income at all. 56% did not have enough food for this week. 53% lacked access to potable water. 89% feared they would not have adequate food this month to feed themselves or their families. Many of these individuals have medical conditions which are worsening because they cannot access basic treatment. 30% live in spaces that lack indoor plumbing. 71% of the children of these families have been out of school since they left their place of origin. The US government with the complicity of the Mexican government are the architects of genocide here. Respectfully, commissioners, this is the fourth time that I have appeared before you since 2017. And each time my colleagues and I return, we bring news that is worse than what we have shared with you before. And I do not know what more I can share, what stories I can bring you that would lead the commission to speak out and to act 
but I do know that every day of delay equals more lives lost. And with every avoidable loss of life, my colleagues and the asylum seekers themselves lose faith in the institutions that exist on paper to protect us from the violations of human rights committed by nation states, but in practicality, do not protect us or asylum seekers at all. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, my name is Yael Shacher, and I work at Refugees International, an independent organization based in Washington, DC that advocates on behalf of forcibly displaced people. On October 20th, 2021, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken told leaders of countries throughout the Americas that migration is a shared problem that is foremost humanitarian, but that immediately must be met by cooperation on increased enforcement and visa controls, and later by addressing factors such as climate change that lead to displacement. Secretary Blinken also mentioned the need to improve asylum processes and expand legal pathways, resettlement and protection. But over the past nine months, the Biden administration has focused primarily on collaboration on enforcement to prevent migrants from accessing protection at the, at the US southern border. Title 42, a public health provision designed to ensure migration does not spread COVID-19, has been misused to expel asylum seekers without according them access to asylum screening or processes, or to testing or treatment for COVID-19. The result has been significant violations of human rights. In August, I visited several cities in Texas and Tamaulipas, Mexico, to understand the implementation of Title 42. What struck me foremost was arbitrariness, both in the treatment of asylum seekers and of health protocols. In Reynosa, I met many Hondurans and Guatemalans, adults and families who were expelled under Title 42 and living in unsafe and unhealthy conditions in a large encampment in the plaza near the port of entry. In Texas, I met adults from Honduras, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Haiti, and Cuba who were sent to the Port Isabel Immigration Prison. Others, however, were released to shelters or bus stations after spending several days in outdoor border patrol processing facilities under poor conditions. In these processing centers, or the one in, under the Andalzuas Bridge, the heat was oppressive and interviews for legal paperwork conducted in flimsy tents that offered no privacy. Families who were not expelled were released to join relatives in the United States and pursue their asylum claims in court, but some were first sent to immigration and custom enforcement run family processing centers or contracted hotels where they had access to COVID testing and vaccines. The arbitrariness and lack of, of access to protection have terrible consequences. I met a pregnant and ill Honduran woman in the encampment in Reynosa. She fled Honduras with her husband and three-year-old son after her store was burned down by gangs who had demanded an extortion payment they could not pay. Once in Northern Mexico, she worried because there was no way for her to know otherwise that if the family crossed the border together, they might be separated and her husband sent to detention. So she crossed a day after her husband and son as it turned out, her husband and son were released and sent to a shelter in Houston. She was held overnight in a freezing border patrol cell before being expelled to Reynosa. She became ill while in the Hilera, fears for her safety in the Reynosa camp, and has no way of reuniting with her family. Speaking to asylum seekers, it became clear that the messaging from the United States do not come and prioritizing enforcement over devising new protections and legal pathways for the forcibly displaced is a fool's errand and has devastating human costs. In the San Antonio bus station, I interviewed a Haitian couple who spoke about a journey from Chile where they faced racism and an inability to get documents and work through the Darien Gap and then through Mexico that took 20 months. In the camp in Reynosa, a Guatemalan father was experiencing chest pain and extreme anxiety. He was worried about the wife and infant daughter back in Alta Vera Praz. A hurricane had completely destroyed their home and injured the nine-year-old son he brought with him as it fell. Father and son was 
had tried to cross the border but been expelled back to Reynosa. So many in the camp were parents with children who were between the ages of eight and 10. Mexico and the United States are thus cynically agreeing that these children cannot be detained as provided under the new Mexican child protection law, but also can be expelled and left to live in deprivation and without access to any services. Safety is also a tremendous concern. A Honduran woman I met in the encampment reported that she had been raped in the plaza the previous day, apparently targeted because of her sexual orientation. People were slightly better situated at the Senda de Vida shelter in Reynosa, but also extremely desperate. Under pressure of litigation over Title 42, the Biden administration agreed to allow particularly vulnerable people identified by attorneys and NGOs working at the border to be admitted through ports of entry despite Title 42. This exemption process lasted through the spring and summer of 2021, but by August, no new cases were being referred for admission. People at the Reynosa shelter were understandably in despair. In the words of a pastor at that shelter, quote, they realized the door was closing and didn't understand why they should be shut out or when the door might open again. I, helped a, I had helped a Honduran family enter the United States through this exemption process in the spring. A woman experiencing a dangerous pregnancy, her husband, her mother, and her severely disabled sister. In late August, I could do nothing for the woman's 16-year-old sister who was stuck in Tapachula, Mexico, and very scared she would be rapidly deported by the Mexican authorities. Even while the exemption process was in place, making it through Mexico to the, the U.S. port of entry was dangerous and impeded by the Mexican authorities. The mother and her disabled daughter were robbed and attacked just outside the port of entry when reporting for this exemption. An American lawyer who I met on my trip worked all summer to help severely ill migrants in Tapachula travel northward and present at US ports of entry after obtaining these exemptions from Title 42. The lawyer has secured approval from, the, from DHS for the admission of a Cuban man with metastatic cancer along with his wife and child who suffered from convulsions. But Mexican officials refused for several months to issue them travel documents and allow them to fly from Tapachula to Matamoros. When they finally made it there, they were held for hours by Mexican and immigration authorities upon arrival at the Matamoros airport. The same happened with the Guatemalan migrant family. When advocates tried to get them out of the Matamoros airport, Mexican officials accused them of involvement with trafficking. Neither family was able to access the medical care they needed or even had adequate food or shelter in Mexico, but Mexican authorities sought to keep them from accessing refuge in the United States. The lawyer also tried to help many Haitians in Matamoros get Title 42 exemptions. The lawyer referred to the Title 42 exemption process as a Schindler's list that created an apartheid situation. Migrants who were not in shelters, who couldn't reach attorneys or organizations, frequently the most vulnerable, were left out. Non-Spanish speakers, especially indigenous migrants and Haitians, received fewer exemptions. Further, Beginning in August, the United States and Mexico began coordinating to expel migrants from both countries without access to protection screenings. The United States started flying asylum seekers from McAllen, Texas to Tapachula and Villa Hermosa. From there, Mexico bust the asylum seekers to a remote part of the Guatemalan border and left them there or bus them through Guatemala all the way to the Honduran border. Thousands of Central Americans have been returned this way without any access to protection. Mexico and the United States also coordinated on the recent mass expulsions of Haitians. A US, as US officials expelled Haitians directly from Texas to Haiti, a country in the midst of a political and humanitarian crisis and racked by gang violence, Mexican officials in Ciudad Acuna and Tamaulipas rounded up patients and sent them southward. And Mexican authorities are now refusing to allow asylum seekers in Southern Mexico to travel northward, keeping them effectively confined in Tapachula, where they have little access to work, housing and serv services, and a prolonged wait if they try to seek asylum. At the Northern border, Mexico and the United States are negotiating the reimposition of the Remain in Mexico program, which will trap asylum seekers in insecure places like Reynosa, Nuevo Laredo, and Matamoros, again, with without an ability to meet their most basic needs. This human rights catastrophe is what happens when collaboration on enforcement supplants cooperation on protection. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. My name is Bill Hing, and in closing for the uh, civil society organizations, I'm a law professor at the University of San Francisco and also run the Immigration and Deportation Defense Clinic. Uh, 
I just want to point out that there was a federal judge in the United States that ruled that the use of Title 42 was improper. The Title 42 is limited to quarantine and containment, and there's nothing in the language that permits the expulsion of individuals using Title 42. And I, I finally want to point out that, that even the president's advisors have advised against the use of Title 42. His chief medical advisor, Anthony Fauci, has said that Title 42 is not the solution. And ironically, when Vice President Harris was a senator, she introduced legislation against the use of Title 42 when Trump invoked it as it failed to protect public health. It's clear that Title 42 had a racial motivation under the Trump administration. Stephen Miller thought of Title 42 before the pandemic to invoke it on the basis of keeping out the flu and the mumps. And then when COVID-19 came on to him, that was all he needed to say that Title 42 could stop out everyone else from a racist perspective. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias a cada uno de ustedes por su participación. Le doy la palabra a los representantes. Thank you very much for your participation. Now I give the floor to the state representatives for 20 minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Hickman, and I'm the Human Rights Officer at the U.S. Mission to the OAS. I'm joined today by colleagues from the U.S. Departments of State and Departments of Homeland Security. And on behalf of the U.S. delegation, we appreciate this opportunity to engage with you today. Public hearings such as the one today play a key role in the inter-American system to ensure that OAS member states are mindful of human rights challenges in their respective countries. We recognize that the United States, like all countries, has work to do. The U.S. government has committed to advancing the promotion and protection of human rights of all persons as demonstrated through a series of statements and actions. We would like to thank the petitioners for sharing your concerns with us today. I will now turn it over to Deputy Assistant Secretary Emily Mandrala from the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs for our first presentation. Thank you very much, Amanda. And I would like to echo the thanks to the petitioners today for sharing your views. Uh, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to share what steps the United States is taking to reduce irregular migration, establish collaborative migration management, and address the root causes of irregular migration. The United States commits to efforts that will effectively and sustainably reduce irregular migration in, from, and through the Western Hemisphere, and this requires a comprehensive approach that addresses both the acute and long-term drivers of irregular migration. There are complex factors that lead individuals to migrate irregularly. We acknowledge that the decision often stems from a profound lack of hope that life in their home countries will improve. The United States continues coordinating with regional partners and stressing a sense of shared responsibility throughout the region to respond to urgent humanitarian needs as well as improve conditions throughout the hemisphere over the long term. Uh, we are working to address root causes and also focusing on collaborative migration management, humane enforcement of our respective borders, expanded options for legal pathways for migration and increased options for international protection and resettlement. We believe that prioritizing both access to protection and humane border enforcement measures are essential to addressing irregular migration. And we have asked countries in the region to join us in prioritizing these two important aspects of migration management. Irregular migration affects all people. It benefits migrant smugglers, human traffickers, and transnational criminal organizations, and puts the lives and personal finances of vulnerable people at risk. It also poses a particular risk to transit communities as we all do, um, continue to deal with the challenges of COVID-19. Irregular migration can also lead to humanitarian crises as we saw in Del Rio. We are working very closely with governments and civil society partners in Mexico and Central America and throughout the region to address migration challenges. We're also working together with regional partners to develop a regional strategy to ensure safe, orderly, and humane migration in a coordinated and sustainable way. We must interrupt the cycle of large-scale transit through countries. This may involve actions like imposing visa requirements and, and meticulously controlling entry across borders, but we also must increase protection and opportunities to identify uh, vulnerable individuals, including victims of human trafficking, and refer them to services or resettle them in safe areas. 
If we do not re reduce the migratory flows throughout the hemisphere, the situation will become unsustainable and possibly resulting in a larger humanitarian crisis. Managing migration involves people and keeping people as safe as possible while enforcing immigration laws. Although the intensity and scale of irregular migrant movements has presented new challenges, we believe that through cooperation and collaboration, we will continue to work with our regional partners to address these challenges. I look forward to our conversation today and to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Daspandrala. I turn next to Deputy Assistant Secretary Marta Youth from the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration to make a statement. Thanks so much. Um, I would also like to, to echo the thanks uh, for the remarks from our civil society colleagues. Um, uh, allow me to expand on Deputy Assistant Secretary Mandrella's remarks, um, particularly with regards to root causes. Um, the, the focus of uh, the Population, Refugees and Migration Bureau is actually the Collaborative Migration Management Strategy. Um, the, the Biden-Harris administration recognizes that migration um, is, is not a new phenomena. People and communities have always migrated in search of better opportunities, in response to natural disasters, to flee persecution, torture, threats from governments, criminal organizations. And the, the collaborative migration management strategy is part of President Biden's comprehensive approach to migration in the region. It complements the root causes strategy, um, and it is <clears throat> coupled along with rebuilding of our asylum system and building legal pathways uh, in the region. Uh, the CMMS is our roadmap to work together with regional governments and other stakeholders to respond to those migrants who are already on the move or at Im in imminent risk of displacement. Origin, transit, reception and destination countries all have a role to play in humanely managing migration throughout the Western Hemisphere. It will take time for the root causes strategy and the CMMS to gain traction. Um, in the near term, we're making progress on these strategies and we're also making progress on um, expanding legal pathways for safe, orderly and humane reception um, for, and humane migration for those seeking to emigrate or in need of international protection. We work very closely with international organizations and NGOs to provide urgently needed humanitarian assistance to vulnerable populations. We're increasing support for reception and reintegration of returned migrants to help them successfully resume their lives at home. And our efforts include improving uh, reception centers, building out local government capacities to provide um, substantial reintegration services, and assisting governments to develop reintegration policies and frameworks. We're supporting international organizations and in working to establish information and orientation centers to assist vulnerable populations in mixed movements so they can access credible, up-to-date information about their rights, about resources available, we're funding programs to assist migrants and potential migrants to inform themselves on things like the risks of irregular migration, migrant smuggling, human trafficking, and by using official sources of information and, and trying to help um, migrants recognize fraud and false information. In terms of expanding legal pathways to the United States um, as appropriate and consistent with our laws, we're, we're really looking at pathways that that um, are pathways to protection um, through refugee resettlement. We're looking at family reunification opportunities, labor opportunities, these non-immigrant uh, temporary work visas, and immigrant visas. I want to highlight um, the Central American Miners Program, which had been terminated um, in 2018 um, and was restarted by um, this administration and um, expanded. Um, expanded to include both um, people in the United States who have um, um, people in the United States who are parents or guardians of minor children in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Um, it, and the eligibility of, of the parents in the United States was expanded so that asylum seekers um, 
uh, with pending asylum applications and pending U visa applications are also able to um, petition for their children. Um, our embassies in Central America are also working to eradicate um, immigrant visa processing backlog. Uh, we, we were concerned that people want to, to um, lose patience in this, and, and so we are, they are uh, trying to eradicate this, this backlog. There's currently no backlogs in the H-2 temporary worker visas, and this new year will bring a robust push to meet the administration's goal of nearly a tenfold increase in H-2A issuances for Guatemalans, Salvadorans, and Hondurans. Also, the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program's allocation for Latin America and the Caribbean for fiscal year uh, 22 is 15,000. This is the largest single year allocation for the region since the passage of the 1980 Refugee Act. To meet this ambitious goal, we're seeking to enhance the capacity of international organizations and civil society to identify and refer more individuals with urgent international protection needs. In addition, we're working to increase the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program processing capacity in the region, and we're continuing to explore additional ways to enhance refugee processing. Um, we're supporting also regional labor migration programs and employment programs that facilitate equitable access to temporary dignified work opportunities in neighboring countries. And we're focused also on ensuring workers' rights in these efforts. Our efforts are complemented by enhanced programming to ensure that the treatment of migrant workers in these programs is fair and humane. And finally, I would just mention um, Secretary Blinken's trip to Colombia last week, where he met with uh, counterparts from 15 countries in the region. And part of his message there was really to strengthen co collaboration with countries in the region, including to increase protection opportunities in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Das Youth. Next, we have presentations from our colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security, beginning with Custom and Border Protection's Acting Executive Director of Policy in the Office of the Commissioner, Remy Krumpak. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished commissioner, petitioners, secretary, staff, and colleagues. It's an honor to appear before you today um, on behalf of U.S. Customs and Border Protection. My name is Remy Krumpak and I'm Acting Executive Director of CBP's Office of Policy. And until last Friday, I served as Acting Deputy Chief of Staff for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. CBP is working to support many elements of the Biden-Harris administration's plan to ensure a fair, orderly, and humane immigration system. CBP is also working with our other U.S. government partners um, to systematically address the influx of migrants at the southwest border in a manner that respects the rule of law, human life, and the dignity of all persons fleeing violence, criminal activity, and destruction caused by natural disasters. In March 2020, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued a public health order to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in CBP holding facilities and in the United States by temporarily suspending the introduction of person, certain persons into the United States from countries where a communicable disease exists. Pursuant to statute, CBP is required to assist the CDC in its implementation of the order. The order indicates that under the Health Service Act and its implementing regulations, the director of CDC is authorized to suspend the right to introduce persons into the United States when the director determines that the existence of a quarantinable communicable disease in a foreign country or place creates a serious danger of the introduction of such disease into the United States. And the danger is so increased by the introduction of persons from the foreign country or place that a temporary suspension of the right of such introduction is necessary to protect public health. Although the order prevents the introduction of certain persons into the United States, it also explicitly recognizes that there is a need for a case-by-case -case exception in certain circumstances. The order indicates that it does not apply to persons whom customs officers determine with approval from a supervisor should be accepted from this order based on the totality of the circumstances, including consideration of significant law enforcement, officer and public safety, humanitarian and public health interests. 
CBP takes this exception very, uh, very seriously. Since the order went into effect, CBP has accepted thousands of persons from the order and continues to improve its procedures for making determinations as to these exceptions. Starting in July 2021, the CDC order has fully accepted unaccompanied children. In implementing the order, DHS will refer a non-citizen to U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services for a Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment screening, otherwise known as CAT, if the non-citizen claims a fear of torture or a fear of return. An asylum officer will then assess whether it is more likely than not that the non-citizen would be tortured in the country to which he or she would be sent. If the non-citizen meets the threshold screening standard, DHS will accept him or her from the order. The CDC order issued pursuant to Title 42 will remain in place until either the expiration of the Secretary of Health and Human Services declaration that COVID-19 constitutes a public health emergency or the CDC director determines that the danger of further introduction, transmission or spread of COVID-19 into the United States has declined such that continuation of the order is no longer necessary to protect the public health, whichever occurs first. The circumstances necessitating the order are reassessed at least every 60 days. I wanna thank the commission again for this opportunity to speak today and for your commitment to promoting and protecting human rights in the Western Hemisphere. Thank you. Our final U.S. statement will come from Catherine Colaton Gonzalez, the Department of Homeland Security's Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished commissioners, petitioners, secretariat staff, and colleagues. On behalf of the United States Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, I very much welcome the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. My name is Kathy Culleton Gonzalez. I was appointed on January 20th by President Biden to serve as DHS's office, office, officer, excuse me, officer for civil rights and civil liberties, or CRCL. I'm designated by federal statute to protect civil rights and civil liberties and to ensure that the department meets our international human rights treaty obligations. Since my appointment, I and my staff have been working to ensure greater access to humanitarian protections and humane treatment for individuals seeking entry at the Southwest border and to ensure that such protections are consistent with our domestic laws and international obligations. This administration and I are also committed to advancing racial equity. Throughout all of our work, we have been particularly focused on those who are most vulnerable or disproportionately impacted, such as children, families, women, black and brown migrants, LGBTQ plus individuals, and those with medical needs. Today, I would like to highlight for you three of, of the efforts that CRCL has taken to address the civil and human rights implications of the department's implication, implementation of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Title 42 authority. First, uh, one avenue that we use to approach our work involves listening sessions. On August the 19th, my office held a listening session specifically about Title 42 with over, with over 30 community organizations who expressed concerns about A, conditions in Mexico and other countries of expulsion, B, the lack of COVID-19 testing, C, access to humanitarian parole, and D, the impact of Title 42 specifically on people of color, among other concerns. Listening sessions held by my office like this one can inform the policy recommendations and advice that CRCL provides to the department and to component leadership. Second, CRCL has provided a number of compliance-based recommendations to the department on Title 42 to, ad to address issues related to civil and human rights. Between March 20th and October 15th, 2021, CRCL received 83 matters and opened 40 complaint investigations alleging civil rights and civil liberties violations related to implementation of Title 42. Following the investigations into these complaints, CRCL made formal recommendations to CBP on August 13th, 2021, regarding medical treatment and humanitarian protections for persons subject to expulsion under Title 42. My office continues to have open complaint investigations and continues to receive new, uh, new allegations and open new complaints related to Title 42. My office's compliance rapid response team conducted observations on September 21st to 22nd of this year in Del Rio, Texas, 
and has opened six complaint investigations related to the treatment of Haitian migrants, including those expelled under Title 42. These investigations are looking into, among other things, allegations related to implementation of Title 42 and other processing authorities, such as parole or issuing, issuing notices to appear, as well as allegations of racial discrimination and allegations of inappropriate use of force through the Border Patrol's horse patrol units. As Secretary Mayorkas stated on September 24th, 2021, with regard to video from Del Rio, we know that these images painfully conjured up the worst elements of our nation's ongoing battle against systemic racism. Third, in addition to the work uh, described above, CRCL has also issued proactive policy advice to address concerns related to Title 42 expulsions, including concerns about returning people who have been expelled to places where it is more likely than not they will be tortured. CRCL has also issued policy advice related to the implementation of exceptions under Title 42, particularly with respect to individuals with heightened vulnerability factors or where a family separation may occur as a result of an expulsion. CRCL also works directly with CBP when we learn about an individual who may qualify for an exception under Title 42, and we pass that along to CBP. Throughout all of this work, our overarching aim is to ensure that individuals at risk of harm are protected. I thank you very much for this opportunity and truly appreciate your attention to these critical issues. Muchas gracias. Eh, con esto se cierra la participación del Estado y entonces va a iniciar la... Thank you very much. Now the um, commission will speak. First of all, I will ask the country rapporteur, second vice president, Flavia Piovesan. Our vice, uh, first vice president, I, I'd like to start uh, expressing deep gratitude and recognition for the relevance of this public hearing about the situation of human rights of migrants and refugees in the US. So thank you so much for all the organizations, uh, all this articulation and network and alliance uh, for sharing so much such a dramatic picture. And I, I also would like to express the solidarity towards all the victims. It was hard to listen. Um, and I'd like to express gratitude and recognition towards the commitment of the state uh, here um, represented and the commitment to change this policy as well and especially. As a reporter, for LGBTI rights. Uh, I must say that regarding LGBTI rights, gender policies, the Inter-American Commission is really proud of the new administration. And we adopt a number of tweets, a number of uh, press releases uh, in this recognition, because we, we do think this could open a new horizon to the whole region. But concerning migrants, refugees is not the case. Yesterday, we had another public hearing about the protection of, um, of, of migrants in the US, Mexico, and North and Central America, and the same level of the analysis were presented. So here, we can, we can face this dramatic, this devastating uh, impact of Title 42, although there is case by case, those exceptions, although it's temporary, uh, what we could see is the arbitrary use of force and the disproportional use of force um, regarding persons and groups in situation of vulnerability. So I'd like to raise three questions uh, to the states, uh, to the state representatives. The first, I, I took note and I, um, I, I was glad to hear at the very end the three measures that I think it's really important, the listening sessions and the, to open channels of complaints and to have proactive policies in terms of recommendations. But it seems to me it would be really crucial to have from the state a report highlighting in a holistic view in a comprehensive view, the impact of Title 42 uh, concerning human rights. 
meaning to apply a human rights impact assessment towards Title 42. Uh, combining pieces, combining this public hearing and the other public hearing so dramatic that we had yesterday, uh, I think it's time uh, and I think it would be really urgent to have this, this report by the state. Uh, so I'd like to ask the state if uh, there is this, um, this horizon of having this uh, report um, focusing on the human rights impact assessment of Title 42. My second question has to do with racism, with intersectionality, as a reporter, again, emphasizing of LGBTI rights, we do know that we have um, this, those disproportional impacts concerning race, ethnicity, gender, sexual abuse. Um, so there is even aggravated suffering in this case. So um, I'd like to, uh, to, to know more, to, to get more precise information about who are all, if we have numbers and disaggregated data, uh, I think it would be very helpful for the commission to understand better the, the gravity of the situation, who are the victims of the impact of Title 42. Um, I heard here that mostly are African descendant um, and who are submitted even to attacks, to violence, hostility and so this will be my second question. And my third question, um, I'm hopeful that Title 42 will not apply anymore as the situation of the pandemic is getting more and more controlled. So I'd like to ask, although I heard that it's temporary, it's temporary and there is this exception case by case, so uh, I think for the commission, it would be really important um, to get the clear map of what would be the policy, the immigration policy of the West concerning cooperation, human rights approach, protection, and not just enforcement. And um, putting aside this, this very, I'd say, military, militarization approach. So thank you so much, First Vice President. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, Commissioner Suardo Rallon has the floor. Yes, Commissioner. Thank you very much, First Vice President. Commissioner, colleagues, I would like to greet the petitioners of the hearing and also the representatives of the state. I would like to say that I am quite concerned about what was pointed out by the civil society organizations who have described a dramatic situation at the beginning of this hearing and on their first intervention, they were saying that there appears to be a perception in the organizations that in terms of the migration situation since 2017 up to now, the situation has been worsening, that there's a situation that's terrifying for many people. It's a situation that leads to a dramatic situation because people feel at risk. And while this is not solved, many other lives might be lost in the midst of this crisis. And they think this is very serious. The organizations were saying something about there's this perception that in the past nine months with the current administration, the Biden-Harris administration, there has been an abuse of Title 42. And even though the state was mentioning some, was, the state was mentioning some measures, and the, I also 
understood that there's a comprehensive approach to uh, this migration situation. So how do you see this situation? Are there any types of abuse that abuses that might be stopped with regards to the application of this title for everybody? Uh, I would like to listen from your reaction about your reaction to what the organizations mentioned. Do you see that abuse? And I must say that within the commission, there are several rapporteurships, thematic and country rapporteurships. I am the rapporteur for Haiti. And in this migration crisis, I saw in the media an incident where several persons from Haiti were confronted by security forces who were on horse and there was a disproportionate use of the force but in particular a treatment no person should suffer in the midst of this migration crisis i understand that there was some sort of a suspension of uh, any actions by the authorities in the border control department, but I would like to know if that suspension is maintained. Is it a permanent policy? Those are my questions. I am aware this is a very difficult situation and a complex problem, but those are my comments and that's what I wanted to ask. Before giving the floor to the special rapporteur, as the first vice president and rapporteur for migrants, I have a couple of comments. First of all, I would like to mention that the Inter-American Commission is preparing a sub-regional report on human mobility that will include Central America, Mexico, and the US. And so all the information the civil society can um, present will be really appreciated by the commission because it'll allow us to uh, draft this report because unlike other reports who were focused on one part, uh, one country, this will have a more holistic approach of this serious problem we are facing. As the vice, second vice president said, the commission appreciates the um, actions of the state, the changes they have implemented, but we must express our concern because we have received information that there are 845,000 people expelled from the US until, uh, sorry, under Article 42 between March 2020 and August 2021. So my first question, my colleagues have all already talked about Article 42. The organizations have expressed how, this, how they see this policy, but both this policy and the Quédate en México program, I, I would like to ask the state if it has assessed these policies, apart from keeping them, these policies have an objective. Has there been an assessment of this policy? Is it meeting the targets it originally had? Because as Nicole Ramos, it's the fourth hearing. There's a lot of information about the human right violations as Commissioner Rallon was mentioning. So my first question is if there has been an assessment of the policy in order to see what are the possibilities to change policies that are leading to these situations. Secondly, apart from the investigations we were uh, we received in another hearing, we discussed the Irwin case for allegations of uh, forced sterilizations. So I would like to know if there have been, there has been an investigation on this. Have there had been other types of investigation about this issue? And this rapporteurship is not only for migrants and refugees, but for human mobility. That also includes victims of human trafficking. And both in the differentiated approach Commissioner Fiovesan was mentioning, but also in this, we are particularly concerned about the situation of women and young girls who try to go across the border and the vulnerability they might be suffering. And that makes them victims of sexual violence and unwanted pregnancies. So along those lines, our question was, if you as a state have 
had any information about these um if these effects and if you're considering this for your migration uh policies and to the civil society do you have any information about uh human trafficking for example anything that you might provide not not now necessarily but maybe in the future in order to supplement the work of this commission having said this i will now give the floor to the uh, rapporteur for ese rights soledad garcia thank you very much madam first president president of the hearing good afternoon everyone thank you uh, from redesca our rapporteurship for the opportunity to take part in this important hearing about a topic that is very um, concerning in terms of these economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. The civil society has pointed out very serious issues, and that is why I would like to uh, share a reflection about the persons who are suffering these situations, because these are persons who are poor, persons who are desperate, who need protection. And I think it's always important to make a strong call for the principle of equality and non-discrimination that should be a priority in any policy, in particular immigration policies, that should have a human rights approach based on social rights. And I was very interested and I really appreciate that the state mentioned that they are implementing measures, thinking about the structural causes that lead people to seek a better life. And I would like to know more about those measures that the state will be implementing. And also I would like to have more information about the investigations Ms. Gonzalez was describing, Ms. Cullington Gonzalez was describing about possible violations of the right to health or access to medical treatment, humanitarian protection. Have there been any sanctions, any case you consider important to share with us? And one final question for now or for whenever you want, in terms of the pandemic, the measures you've been implementing to prevent the spread of the disease, to um, help people cover their needs at shelters? And have there been any measures in terms of vaccines for COVID-19 for these persons? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rapporteur. I will now give the floor to the civil society for 12 minutes. I, I would like to address a few of the comments raised by the government. Um, that Title 42 is a public health law is just simply not true. I live in Tijuana, Mexico. I see US citizens and legal permanent residents come and go every single day, maskless, coming to the beach, coming to restaurants, coming to enjoy entertainment, and then returning maskless to the United States. And as they are being inspected, they are not being subject to any sort of COVID screening, nor are they required to be vaccinated. Yet we are preventing asylum seekers from entering the US from Mexico because we fear COVID. We don't fear COVID, we fear migrants. The government also talked about collaborative migration management, but with our, our regional partners, ignoring the fact that some of our regional partners have been accused and have been documented to be guilty of numerous and serious human rights abuses extending up until present day. We talk about irregular migration as a problem to be avoided. Irregular migration has been happening since the dawn of time, since the Jews were trying to flee Egypt. However, what causes the crisis is the US government's refusal to honor its obligations, which it agreed to after World War II to provide refuge for people fleeing persecution. That is the crisis. And the US government would have you believe that we do not have the capacity to process the backlog of refugees when we are responsible for creating the backlog. And the idea that CBP, which has the largest law enforcement budget of any law enforcement agency in the country does not have the resources to process refugees to clear the backlog is laughable. 
And worse, the government has consistently put out lies to the public, to, to uh, bodies uh, that are reviewing this, that they don't have capacity. But in the context of our litigation of Al Otro Lado v. Mayorkas, as well as documented by an Office of Inspector General report in October 2020, that idea about capacity being limited has always been a pretext. And the purpose of these policies is to prevent migration. And I will just end on, on two things. Uh, there was a comment about unaccompanied minors still being allowed to present themselves at the port of entry, irrespective of Title 42. That is a lie. My staff regularly has to accompany unaccompanied minors to the port of entry and argue with officers at the port of entry requesting supervisor intervention in order for those vulnerable children who are traveling alone to be accepted. And I am frankly shocked that they continue to say that they are willingly accepting minors. You have to show up with an attorney if you are a minor at the port of entry. The government says that they're trying to prevent human traffickers from taking advantage of migrants. We are the biggest supplier of humans for those traffickers. Thousands of people are kidnapped as a result of Title 42 every month because cartels understand that people are being expelled routinely at specific spots and they are waiting there to snatch them up. They then contact their family members and friends in the United States and demand exorbitant sums of money to be paid in order for them to be freed. Our staff has seen videos of migrants with their heads being held at gunpoint. We have worked with families that not only the adults have been tortured by the traffickers extorting their families, but also their very young children, as young as two years old, being threatened to be fed to by dogs. That is what Title 42 does. We are supplying the bodies for the human traffickers and the hundreds of thousands of dollars that have been paid out by sources in the United States to cartel kidnappers in Mexico has only made them grow stronger. The US government is disingenuous. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to respond. Um, on the issue of um, capacity, um, you know, I, 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 you know, that what happened at Del Rio with the Haitians specifically, you know, Secretary Mallorca told, told one of the morning talk shows on, after that event happened um, that, you know, it was impossible given the numbers that arrived um, for CBP to test the Haitians for COVID before putting them on back on, on expulsion flights to Haiti. Um, you know, there were like 70 flights to Haiti within like th three or four weeks. Um, so the idea that we can get that organized, but we can't test people for COVID just seems a little bit um, hard to understand. Um, the other thing I wanted to, I have two other things um, about the CAT screenings um, that are part of COVID, of uh, the uh, Title 42. Um, just a few statistics. Um, since March of 2020, as of, as of the end of September, um, between March of 2020 and the end of September, um, 1,163,000 um, people were expelled uh, under Title 42. Um, as of the end of September, only 3,217 migrants processed under Title 42 were referred for interviews for CAT screenings with U.S. asylum officers. Just 272 of those 3,217 migrants passed the interviews. So I think what I'm trying to say is, is that it's, it's just, that's not asylum, that's not access to asylum. Um, that is not what, what's happening. Um, to say that is, is, is not what Harold Coe said, uh, and, I, and I, I frankly don't believe it either. Um, and the very last thing is, you know, I am, I am very excited about the plans for future legal pathways um, and, um, you know, collaboration on protection. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear about them and I look forward to seeing them implemented. They just haven't happened yet. Um, and so what we've seen mostly is just this enforcement. And I, I, that is what we have seen so far. So the plans are great, but what we've seen so far um, is this enforcement that, that Nicole and I have, have been talking about. Thank you. Yeah, I wanna thank uh, the representatives of the administration for, for
for responding. Really, honestly, very much appreciate it. Um, I, I haven't been to the border since the Biden administration uh, came into being. I've been at the border many times during the Trump administration. I was one of the inspectors that blew up the Clint CBP facility uh, a couple of years ago uh, when the Biden administration was abusing children at the CBP facility in, in, in Clint. Um, I want to tell you, though, my regular conversations with people like Dr. Shocker and Nicole, there's a disconnect. I, I, I really want to believe that you all from the administration have your heart in the right place. But I'm telling you, there is a disconnect between what you're reporting and what you're, you seem to be hearing and what's happening on the ground. And I, I hope that your good faith is, is exercise that this is, should not be happening. I mean, and, and uh, we ought to be ashamed of, of the treatment of folks at the border. And so I really pray that you take what has been said seriously. So thank you. Thank you actually for, for being here and listening. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. So the civil society participation or intervention has concluded. Now I give the floor to the state for seven minutes. I'm happy to start. And um, thank you all for your comments. Thank you, commissioners, for your comments. And thank you again to civil society for your comments and your follow-up questions. I will take the opportunity to, to share more about the efforts to address root causes of migration in Central America. And I will stress that there are efforts underway to address acute causes um, with, the, with, with the understanding that there are urgencies. And there is also though, um, um, at its core, the strategy to address root causes in Central America is, is just that, um, a strategy to address the root causes. And it will take time to be implemented in full and to show results. Uh, the um, administration, um, President Biden signed an executive order on February 2nd calling for the development of a root causes strategy. Uh, and over the course of, of several months until July 29th, the um, um, administration worked and the Vice, Vice President Kamala Harris led the administration's diplomatic efforts to address root causes of migration from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, worked with bilateral, multilateral private sector partners, as well as civil society leaders um, to help people from the region find, find hope at home. Uh, and this complemented work done throughout the US government over the last six months to learn lessons from prior efforts to consult with a, um, a wide range of stakeholders to inform the development of the strategy. And then on July 29th, the Biden-Harris administration released publicly the root causes strategy, a core component of the comprehensive effort that we have talked about here to establish fair, orderly, and humane migration systems. The strategy identified, prioritizes, and coordinates actions to improve security, governance, human rights, and economic conditions in the region. And it um, makes use of US government tools, including diplomacy, foreign assistance, public diplomacy, and sanctions to address root causes of, of migration. Uh, implementing the strategy will rely on the expertise of a wide range of US departments and agencies with support from governments in and outside the region, civil society, private sector, multilateral organizations, international financial institutions in the US Congress. Um, and we are working to mobilize the necessary resources and at the same time being very forward leaning with our diplomatic engagement in order to carry that out. Quickly, uh, the strategy is organized around five pillars. The first is to address economic insecurity and inequality. The second, combat corruption, strengthening democratic governance and advancing the rule of law. Third, promoting respect for human rights, labor rights and free press. Fourth, countering and preventing violence, extortion and other crimes perpetrated by criminal gangs, trafficking networks and other organized criminal organizations. And fifth, combating sexual, gender-based and domestic violence. The pillars are, are working, um, they are all intertwined. We are not working in silos. We recognize in particular the need to address um, democratic governance um, throughout all of the pillars. Um, uh, and I will stop there and turn it over to my colleague, Marta Youth. Thank you, 
Thanks so much, Emily. Um, I'll just, um, I know that my colleagues from DHS uh, will want to speak, so I don't want to take up the time, but I just thought that, you know, I know um, Dr. Um, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Shasher, Shayla? Shacker. You're laughing. Right. I got it wrong. But, yeah. Shacker, thank you. I should have listened better at the beginning now, and then I got caught with the, um, you had mentioned that you were interested in the, the, the collaborative migration management strategy and was heartened to hear about it. So it's it's like my, I, I do feel like it is, um, you know, in, in terms of the administration's approach that was, as Emily uh, just described, that was laid out in, in the executive order in, in February. This is, this is, there, there, there have frequently been root causes strategies, and the the current root causes strategy is kind of new and on steroids. But, but the the collaborative migration management strategy, this is something very, very. I don't think there's ever been one that an administration has put forward, and and so I just thought um, I'd just kind of go over quickly the the eight lines of effort because I I do think that. Um, you know, if implemented heartily as we are robustly as we are trying to do, um, I think this is this really does address um, some of the needs in in addition to the root causes strategy. And the first is of the eight lines of efforts. The first is stabilizing populations with acute needs. So this is like essentially a humanitarian assistance surge. The second is expanding access to international protection. And this is by, you know, also building asylum systems um, in countries that are, are amenable throughout the region. Um, and, you know, Mexico has, has a, a pretty robust asylum system currently. I mean, I think a, a little overwhelmed, but robust, right? Um, Expanding access to protection in countries of origin, and by this, this addresses the the issue uh, that uh, several of you have mentioned about um, internally displaced persons, right? So really, working with governments in the region to to, to kind of come up with way policies and ways to um, to provide protection for displaced persons, and 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 now you know even um, in addition to the other the normal or well-known uh, causes of displacement. Climate change is also another um, cause of displacement. And, and so kind of addressing and stabilizing and providing resilience adaptation for that particular uh, concern. Uh, temporary labor programs um, is another improving and expanding them um, in the region. So th these are pendular uh, labor programs. Um, and people will be returned, uh, deportations, right? And so, but but having, but, but providing essentially a safety net, a way to assist and reintegrate returned persons. Um, and, and borders must be managed, right? But, but they, but the, the, the collaborative migration management strategies is, focuses on, you know, fostering secure and humane ways to manage borders, right? There are secure and humane ways to manage borders. Um, seventh part uh, line of effort is regional um, public messaging of migration, and part of this um, really is to, to to try to help people um, stay out of the hands of smugglers and traffickers, and and you know, and the, and which is um, you know increasingly difficult. And finally. Um, this was supposed to be a separate line of effort, but we included it uh, in the collaborative migration management strategy, which was the access to lawful pathways. And really, you know, that is something that we've really been trying to, to build up. As I mentioned, the CAM, you know, re-upping the Central American Miners Program and expanding it out so that um, greater numbers of people um, in different cate categories um, will be eligible for it. But But it's also the labor pathways to the United States, um, you know, as well as um, the protection transfer arrangement, uh, whereby people um, in uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, um, you know, who are who are vulnerable can be uh, referred to that program, and then um, uh, while they wait for their refugee processing in Costa Rica. So these are all um, efforts um, that were that I think combined are you know a very helpful approach in the region. 
And now I will, uh, I, sorry, I took up a lot of time, but I will turn to my DHS colleagues. Thank you so much to my colleagues at State and to all of the presenters and the commissioners. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna, I took note of questions. I'm gonna respond to the ones that I can and some of them I'm gonna have to get back to you later. So to Commissioner Pio Vesan, um, I'm gonna have to get back to you later with your questions, but I do appreciate all of them. Um, especially the question about international about intersectionality. Um, and as far as a report goes, I think that's um, something that we're gonna have to discuss internally and I will get back to you. Um, <clears throat> to Commissioner Rallon, I'm also muy preocupada, very worried and take these um, uh, problems very seriously. Uh, we are investigating the incidents in Del Rio that you talked about con la, la, el uso de fuerza de los caballos y que, es, que no ha sido muy digno. We are investigating this and we take it very seriously. Um, to uh, Commissioner Mantilla, uh, you mentioned um, the situation of women and girls and even you know, some of the occurrences at Irwin. I want to reemphasize that this administration has closed the Irwin facility. We have taken concrete measures to close the facility where those abuses um, um, occurred. Um, so we take that very seriously. And as we do our evaluation of policies and investigations um, in my office, the Office of, of um, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, we will certainly take into account gender and sexual abuse and the protections needed uh, for women, girls, LGBTQ persons. Um, for um, uh, Senora Soledad Garcia Muñoz, um, I wanted to tell you, um, perdón que, que le voy a hablar en, en inglés, but for our investigations, they are ongoing. We have six open investigations right now, and we do have a process. Um, you can find out about it on our website, and I'm also happy, happy to share that information. But once we do an investigation, we issue a recommendation to the component. Um, so for example, our investigation um, around Title 42 um, has been issued to, um, to the Border Patrol, to CBP, and they have an opportunity to respond or concur and not concur. But everything about our investigations is transparent, as transparent as is legally possible, because we need to protect some um, deliberative process um, information. But I also just wanted to emphasize, while we're very glad to be working with the Commission, we want to continue investigations that are needed. So please reach out to us um, on our website or to CRCL compliance at hq.dhs.gov. We want to look into the allegations that we've heard about today and also of course collaborate with the commission who is also looking who, who is also looking into the allegations. But please to all of the advocates who testified and I understand not everybody has access to this information, but if you give the information to us, we will investigate it. I promise you that. Um, let's see, with regard to the, the CAT screenings to Yael, I'm very sorry, I might mispronounce your last name also, so excuse me, um, but uh, thank you very much for the data. I'd love to hear more about the data with regard to the, to the CAT screenings. Um, that is the last of the questions I've written down. I'm sorry, for Professor Hang, we do take this very seriously and we will continue to investigate and continue to receive information and continue to work on the three measures that are under my jurisdiction, uh, which is listening sessions, complaint, uh, compliance investigations, and giving recommendations about um, policy, including immigration policy from a civil and human rights perspective. Thank you so much. And with that, I'll pass it along to my colleague, Remy. Thank you so much for, again, for this opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to give a few high level points as I know we're short on time. Uh, from CBP's perspective, uh, immediately after the events in Del Rio, we dispatched a large cadre of OPR, Office of Professional uh, Responsibility investigators to the scene to look further into the incident. Um, as those investigations remain ongoing, I'm not gonna comment any more on, on that right now, but we take, we take the allegations very seriously and it's our intent to actually investigate them and reach real conclusions about what happened um, or what didn't happen. And, and we are very committed to, you know, expanding our capacity um, in OPR and, and investigating uh, whatever complaints arise. Um, in terms of processing capacity, I think that was one of the areas that was, was raised um, CBP is always looking for new and innovative ways to improve its uh, processing capacities. Um, 
we understand the need to humanely and expeditiously process individuals that are at the border. Um, we are looking and we have created a new position called the Border Patrol Processing Coordinator position. Um, these Border Patrol Processing Coordinators are going to be non-law enforcement employees that are going to be charged with assisting and processing persons seeking to enter the United States and caring for migrants to free up um, Border Patrol agents for the processing of migrants and other uh, law enforcement duties. Uh, to date, we've actually onboarded 227 of these um, BPPCs um, and in coming years, we intend to greatly expand the number of these BPCs in the workforce. Um, CBP has a target goal of having 600 BPPCs uh, for fiscal year 2022 and 1,200 total over the next four years. This will Agradezco. greatly... I appreciate this. Thank you, State. But it's time. I can give you an extra 30 seconds to wrap up. We, we, we anticipate that we'll have much more uh, processing capacity as a result of this new position. I also just did want to highlight, you know, CBP has greatly worked to expand its, its medical um, provisions for migrants at the border in recent years, such that um, they do get better medical care now than they did in the past. We have now 800 medical providers at 70 facilities along the southwest border. We are definitely trying to improve our range of critical emergency and non-critical uh, uh, medical care services at the border so that when folks do come into our custody or make contact with us, we do have the capacity to deal with whatever their medical concerns are. Thank you again for the opportunity today. Muchas gracias. Vamos llegando al cierre de esta audiencia. Okay, we are reaching the end of this hearing. First of all, I'd like to thank the delegation of the state for their being here, for their replies, and for the changes we have noticed. But between the changes and the roadmap and the assistance you are describing, there's a really difficult and serious decision. So we trust in the possibility to keep on working with the commission to visualize and also enforce this cooperation to act before the migration emergency that has been going on for several administrations. We know that, but it's reaching a very serious level in the region. During this period of sessions, the Inter-American Commission approved a resolution on the situation of Haiti. We will be publishing it and you will be able to read it with our, it, it will have our assessment of the facts. Now, with regards to the information you provided, I know time is not enough, but the communication will be sending you a letter uh, under Article 18 so that the state can complete the information that we requested. Also, next year, we already have an authorization by the state of Mexico to travel. We have, we have had um, a virtual visit. We have talked to the officials in charge of the migration policy. I have talked to the country rapporteur, and I think it would be very interesting for the commission to go back to the border, to the U.S. border with, with Mexico. If you agreed, this would be one of the actions by this new administration that could allow us to recover some hope for a population that is suffering so much. As Commissioner Piovesan was saying, during the hearing and the virtual hearings um, visits, we have talked to people who have family members who have, these family members have disappeared in the border. You know about this. So we will be talking about the possibility of carrying out a visit that will allow us to see in person the um, the stories you are sharing with us today. I would like to thank the state, but in particular the civil society, not only for their being here, as I always say, but for their day-to-day -day work. I have heard of commitment from the state, but also pain. And I know it's not just your pain, but the pain of all the people you help every day, who I'm sure must be hearing 
uh, must be listening to this hearing. Nicole was saying this is the fourth hearing, but we don't want hope to be lost. And the commission will continue to be there for every person. And we want to thank you because in the claims you have made in your demands, beyond the pain and the commitment, we find a huge commitment for human rights and the despair and frustration uh, that you must feel when you cannot do anything, when you see uh, women or children, as Nicole Ramos was uh, saying, in terms of trafficking, of human trafficking. So the commission wants to do everything it can to manage some sort of international cooperation. And I wanted to say something else that I think is very important. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights establishes in its Article 14 that all persons have a right to seek and enjoy asylum. Nevertheless, the American Declaration, which came about a few months before, establishes that all persons have the right to seek and receive asylum in foreign territory in according to the legislation in land. So there's a difference between uh, seeking and enjoying and seeking and receiving. And we know that this is part of the principle of use coges and international customs that um, by which uh, the states of the OAS are bound. So that's what we want. We want to facilitate dialogue, information. We know it's uh, an issue that's very, very difficult. I know the state can do what it's trying to do, but it's very complicated. And the commission receives daily testimonies of mothers, family members, girls, and our role is to be there for you right now and to do everything we can to improve this situation. And as you were all saying, I mean, we have all been migrants or the children of migrants or, and or refugees, and our last names show that. So, we wrap up this hearing, but also this period of sessions. I think it's very symbolic to close it with this call to hope. I would like to thank the team of the Inter-American Commission, the Executive Secretariat, both Deputy Executive Secretariat, everyone you're seeing with their screens turned off, the Chief of Staff, Norma Coledani, each of the persons who have made it possible for us to meet at these hearings, because this is a team that works on monitoring, who listen to the testimonies and continually show this commitment that the uh, Inter-American Commission wants to express. Thank you. I will close now this hearing and this period of sessions. Good afternoon. Un saludo, thank you so much. Thank you very much.